Welcome. This is Dr. Kathleen Walsh, a clinical instructor with the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin. I am accompanied by Dr. Melissa Stiles. Hello, Dr. Stiles. Hello, Dr. Walsh. It's good to be here again. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about preoperative evaluation, concentrating on assessing cardiac risk. Ooh. Why is this important? We know that 25 to 30 percent of postoperative deaths are from cardiac causes, and the rate of post-op cardiac events increases with age. So by performing a cardiac risk assessment ahead of time, we can determine who needs further intervention. I think I'm getting chest pain as we speak. Well, how do you assess cardiac risk? I utilize the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines, which is an algorithm. So there are basically four steps. Number one, have they had any recent revascularization or stress testing? Two, you want to determine their clinical predictors. These are underlying disease, signs or symptoms. Three, determine their functional capacity. And four, determine surgical risk. Someone undergoing a breast biopsy, not considered really high surgical risk. When you say recent revascularization or stress testing, how far back do you go? If a patient has undergone coronary revascularization in the past five years without worsening symptoms, or patient has had a normal stress test or angiogram in the past two years without symptoms, they don't need any further cardiac evaluation. Go straight to surgery. What are the clinical predictors? So that's the next step. So if in the first they do not have either, then you need to go ahead and determine the clinical predictors. The clinical predictors are basically history of cardiac disease or are they having any current signs or symptoms. It's divided into major, intermediate, and minor. So the major clinical predictors are, have they had a recent MI in the past six weeks? Do they have unstable angina, decompensated congestive heart failure, significant arrhythmias, or severe valvular disease? You want to get a cardiology consult. Intermediate clinical predictors are, have they had an MI but it's more than six weeks ago? Do they have mild, stable angina, compensated congestive heart failure, or diabetes, then you want to stress test if it's a high-risk procedure or the patient has low functional capacity. Minor clinical predictors are a rhythm other than sinus, such as controlled atrial fibrillation, abnormal EKG, such as a bundle branch block, history of a stroke, advanced age, or low functional capacity. In these people with minor clinical predictors, you want to stress test at the high-risk procedure and the patient has low functional capacity, so you need both. How do you determine functional capacity? I mean, if a patient were to come in and they're pretty active already, they're mowing the lawn two to three times a week, or climbing stairs, or do they have to go through a stress test? I mean, some of them go through stress tests themselves at home. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you really want to make sure they can do at least four mets. And so the examples you gave are perfect. Can they climb one flight of stairs or mow the lawn? Also, other examples of being able to perform poor meds without symptoms are gardening, golfing, playing doubles tennis, or square dancing. Can they walk two blocks at a normal pace? So if they can do any of these activities without symptoms, then you can be comfortable that they have good functional capacity. How do you stratify surgical risk? Again, we stratify into three different categories, high, intermediate, and low. So a high-risk surgical procedure will be one, major peripheral vessel, a cabbage, anything involving the aorta, prolonged procedure, or emergency surgery. Intermediate surgical risk includes abdominal surgeries, gallbladder, colon resection, thoracic surgeries, head and neck, prostate surgeries, orthopedic procedures, and carotid endarterectomy. More risk surgical procedures include anything endoscopic involving the eyes, such as a cataract surgery, breast surgery, or other superficial procedures. Can you comment on the role of beta blockers, uh, pre-surgical, post-surgical, or? Yes, uh, they've definitely been shown to decrease risk, particularly in patients greater than 65 in the perioperative period. So it's important, obviously, if they're on one, you continue it. If they have known coronary artery disease, or two or more risk factors for coronary artery disease, you should consider starting one. Well, when do you start it? Like the day before, a week before? Uh, usually start about a week before and continue 
then two to three weeks after. And many patients you want to continue, um, consider long term, especially if they have coronary artery disease. I've read that those patients who have to undergo emergency surgery, many times you can give them a dose of a beta blocker prior to surgery. Is that correct? Yes, there are different protocols. So in review, what are the take-home points? So in review, you first want to know if they have had any recent revascularization, stress testing, or angiogram. If not, then focus on their clinical predictors. If they have any of the major clinical predictors, they need further cardiac evaluation. If they have intermediate clinical predictors, then you want to test if they have poor functional status or they're undergoing a high-risk surgery. If they have minor clinical predictors, test if they have poor functional status and they're undergoing a high-risk surgery. Is there an algorithm that we can place into our Palm Pilot or we can carry with us to look at? If it's 2 o'clock in the morning, I have an emergency surgery, I can go through this. Oh, definitely. So just Google American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association practice guidelines, and you will be able to find this guideline. Well, thank you, Dr. Stiles. I appreciate your time. You're welcome.